like JoJo. They're the best thing. There is giving away. Good evening. Hi. <laughs> Just always waiting for the dean to quiet down so we can begin. <laughs> uh, welcome. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, those of you I haven't met before, those of you online who I haven't met, uh, my name is Matt Bell. I'm a professor in the Department of English uh, and Creative Writing here at ASU. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the first ever workshop of the new ASU World Building Initiative. Um, before we start, I just want to thank a few people, including Dean Jeffrey Cohen, who was instrumental in encouraging and supporting the formation of this initiative, as well as the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Department of English, for funding it. Uh, thanks also to the staff of the Lincoln Center for Applied Ethics, where the initiative is housed, um, especially Karina Fitzgerald and Jan Long in the front, who did so much of the work to make this event happen. So thank you all so much. Um, let me make sure this works. Oh, it's not. One second. <laughs> Okay. There we go. All right. Okay, we're back. Um, sorry about that. We're still figuring out some bugs. Um, I just want to say a couple of things about the uh, World Day Initiative before we begin. Uh, the idea behind this was really to build on some of the work we started doing in a, a world building for science fiction and fantasy class that I've been teaching here for the last couple of years. Some of the people who are in it right now are in it. Some of the people who have been in classes past. Um, where we're really studying science fiction and fantasy and doing our own world building and also thinking about the ways that these tools help us imagine futures and think about other ways our world could be. Um, we're also looking at this as a chance to leverage the uh, breadth of knowledge and expertise and imagination that's in our humanities uh, community here at ASU and to interact with uh, people in the public and people across the world. I know we have at least one person on the Zoom from New Zealand today, so we're sort of already going from AS from Arizona to New Zealand on our first go. It feels really great. Um, I'll just say we're also referring to this semester workshops kind of as our play test and sort of figuring out what we want to do, how things sort of work. The way tonight's is going to work is we're going to have two presentations from members of our humanities community here, both from the Department of English. I'll introduce them in just a second. And then the second half, we'll have a world building exercise that everyone will be able to participate in, whether you're in person or online. Uh, we'll be inventing some new words together. So as you're hearing about sort of constructed language and language and how it works in the world, um, please also sort of be thinking about the uh, words you'd like to invent and the world you'd like to make with them. Um, okay, I'm gonna introduce our two presenters so we can get started. Our first presenter tonight will be Tyler Peterson. His personal and professional roots are in the Pacific Northwest of Canada. He did his dissertation on that. I meant to ask you how to pronounce this language. You'll have to do it for me. I'm going to mess up. I'll let you do it when you come up. The Gitscan language at the University of British Columbia. Although his professional home is in an English department, his work focuses on the documentation, revitalization, and maintenance of endangered indigenous languages, primarily in the Americas and Oceania. He has a special interest in exploring how everyday technology and contemporary media can be used as a tool for language documentation and engaging the language learner, as well as developing teaching resources in these areas. His research as a linguist involves the theoretical and empirical approaches to the study of meaning, semantics, and pragmatics. Being situated in Arizona, he has extensive experience working with the indigenous communities and their languages, neighboring ASU and throughout the Southwest. Our second uh, speaker tonight will be Rose Smith. Rose Smith is a writer, artist, and dog parent. The writing centers communities of non-humans, humans, and the lands in which they encounter one another. They are currently imagining non-anthropogenic languages for creating art. They are first year MFA candidate in fiction at ASU. Uh, please help me welcome Tyler Peterson. I think I might be in the wrong place. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you invited me to come and present a couple of months ago, and I'm serious about this, I read the description, the web page that you have, and I thought, I thought we were going to word. Word building. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying this for an effect. I actually thought it was about word building, but basically, no. I did read it more carefully. <laughs> so I think I might be okay. So you want to click on to go forward? Yes. I just want you to like spend a few moments with that and let that sort of wash over you, sort of bask in the glory of 
We've got long life obstruents, we've got labial life dealers, we've got lateral fricatives. Yeah, just spend a moment with that. You see some of the looks on your faces. This is something you haven't seen before. <laughs> <laughs> I might have thought that I just sat on my keyboard. He had had in his possession a bunch of very <laughs> it's rather prosaic translation for whatever that is. I guess it's a word of some kind. I would pronounce it for you, but I don't speak the Nuhalk language. So Nuhalk is a, is a First Nations language that's spoken in, in the central coast of Canada. It's right up there. It's part of the Salishan family. It's highly endangered. There are only like maybe three speakers of this language left. I don't know if you roam too much with you. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, yeah, okay, I've got to have them roaming. Yeah. Yeah. Like, they can anchor Sorry. myself here. Right. Hi, everyone. <laughs> this is this is a natural language. Okay. And I've got that italicized. Natural language for us means it's a language that humans produce. So, whatever your impression was of that language, and I can see from your faces, because I've done this before, right? The smiles, sometimes there's gasps, right? This is, we have an impression of these things that sort of goes beyond our expectations. But that is a language that's learned by humans. It's not even considered to be that unusual, typologically. Click, click. You got it now. Oh, there we go. Right. For those of us who study these things, and this is one of the things that I do, um, we've got different tools that we can take this apart, right, to look inside of a word, right? And so we can reveal its inner parts there, what we call a morphological analysis. That's actually what word building is. When I see this word, I think of morphology. So morphology is a scientific study of word formation, how we build words out of smaller units like this, right? I mean, there's some sort of technical terms in there, but um, right, and then we've got a way of transcribing the pronunciation. If anybody wants to give it a shot, I, I can't do it. It's, it's pretty <laughs> tough. Although I have heard this word, and it actually sounds pretty normal once you get over some of the sounds you're not used to, and we also write it as well. Okay. So the idea behind that is to think about what a word is, okay? And you can see right away, uh, if you look not even that far beyond English, you lose your footing pretty quickly in terms of what you think a word is. In Hulk, it's an entire sentence or what we call a proposition, which is a thought about something. Maybe you've come across this trope. Like, have you come across this? Like I did even just this morning, sort of in a formal, just to check in to see what's happening in the media, but it's still around, right? You, you come across this everywhere. This is at least a century old, this trope. It started from the, the work of a linguist called Franz Boas, who did some work up in Arctic Canada. And then it was picked up by the media back in the 20s, and they kind of ran with it, right? It's this exoticization of language, which I'm kind of doing a little bit, okay? But I'm doing it intentionally. And so there's eight words, 13, 26, it's like X number of words, okay? Um, and as recently as 2013, I found an article in the Washington Post that's still doing this because it's a myth, right? This is a myth. There, so what is often called the Great Ethical Vocabulary Books, which is a really good book, by the way, by Jeffrey Fulham. Um, if you're looking for something to read along these lines, yeah, they do have a lot of words for snow and snow-like things. By the way, Eskimo is an exonym and it's a derogatory word. We don't use it anymore. Okay, I'm using it because I'm just reporting what we know about this. Um, so this, so what we call Eskimo is really uh, an entire range of languages in the circumpolar region, right across from Russia, Alaska, Canada, Greenland. Okay, so yeah, we're gonna discard that. But yeah, but you can see from English translations, these are just words. And so we have a lot of words for these things too. Okay, when we think about words are, uh, well, I dug out the Yupik dictionary, which is one of these languages, and just to see what was happening. And yeah, there are a lot of different ways of talking about frozen water. Okay, um, you can see these slides later, I'll let you have a look at those. Um, there's not a lot, any, there's nothing really exotic happening here. We describe the same things in English. What's really happening here is a kind of word building. Okay, here's another example. Um, from West Greenlandic, I can't pronounce that language name. So we've got this root, okak, probably. And then we can derive a lot of other things from that that are about the tongue. And even in you know more familiar Western European languages, this is a thing like lingua. It's tongue and it's also language. 
right? So we can sort of step back from exoticizing these things a little bit and look at what's actually happening. It, at face value, these look like words, and they are words, but it's not as simple as that, okay? Once we think about word building, because that's what's happening, it's morphology. I don't know what these other morphemes do in this language, but I managed to pick out the, and I just did that myself uh, from the dictionary. I can see the root there, it's pretty clear, okay? Right, so what this is, so what I'm getting at here is, or what I'm talking about is, is, well, a couple of things. One is the exoticization of language, right? And really looking at what it means to be a word. Because if we're talking about word building and world building, <laughs> Right, we need to we need to sort of like be rooted in the foundation of really I would say a scientific view of what language is. That's what I do as a linguist. Okay, I'm interested in um, so I'm a semanticist. That's how I identify the specialization of linguistics. And what I'm concerned with is, uh, as Matt said, the a theoretical explanation uh, for the connection between what you think and what you say. So meaning in language. So it's adjacent to philosophy of language. So it's gonna go in that direction a little bit. What this is about is something we call adaptive growth. See, in English, we've got all these words here, right? For, to talk about snow. So right away, Eskimo, the Alouette languages are not anything special that way. And so it's easy to kind of exoticize them. They just have a different way of making words than we do. This is a part of what's called adaptive growth. And this is probably the first thing to learn about making words. Okay, that words emerge as we need them. Think of the word telephone here, right? So before the telephone, uh, I mean, what do we call the thing? Like when Alexander Graham Bell made what? Like when was that? <laughs> anyway, right. like the last century or so, right? We didn't have a word, so we made one out of Greek, incidentally, like we do Greek and Latin. We just pull things together and we assemble words. This is adaptive growth. Yixen, which is a language that I do research on around Nukalk, it's neighboring to Nukalk. Um, right, was faced with a similar situation in the turn of the last century when they put the telegraph poles in and phones started going up. They called them Tuktsum Alga. So it's a language that I do know. And this is composed of Tuktsum, which means black, and Alga, which is language or tongues, actually. And they call it black talk. Mm -hmm. The reason why they call it black, can anybody guess, actually? Think about full tiny phones. Mm -hmm. What color were they? Black. They were all black. All of them were black. It was made of that black kind of, a, what's the name of that material? Sort of a plastic. All the phone lines were black, so they called it black talk. That's adaptive growth. They made something up when they needed it. So what I'm touching upon here, sort of making a bit of a pivot into a couple of notions that I think are really important to keep in mind when you're creating something. And that is the difference between linguistic relativism and determinism. Maybe you've come across these terms before. I'm not going to read all these things in detail. What we're talking about with the Gixan and the English and the West Greenlandic is what's called linguistic relativism. So there is something to your environment. And the language and the adaptive growth that we go through is reflecting that. Okay, so there are some problems with that and there's some limitations to it. This is opposed to something we call linguistic determinism. And this is where this, these hoaxes come from. And I'll show you a couple of others. Okay, so linguistic determinism is a stronger form of relativism. So language and its structures determine human knowledge, thought, and thought process, such as categorization, memory, and perception. So you can see where that goes to a pretty dark place pretty quickly. Okay, and that's what people are engaging in when they're looking at things like these language hoaxes. Okay, or even what I'm doing a little bit with the new poll, and I'm doing it intentionally to show you something. The idea is that if you don't have a word for it, then you can't know it. So if I showed you that new Hulk word, right, and you asked you to translate that word, you're going to have a tough time. Does that mean that you're not able to understand? He had had in his possession a bunch of very good right? That goes off the rails really quickly. Okay. And so, yes, in my field, we've basically disproven that, even though it's people still trade in this idea. Okay. And what's relevant to us is the notion of untrans uh, um, untranslatability. Okay, we can actually translate anything from anything else. I just showed you a few examples of that. And it's not even that difficult. So just to dispel that notion, this is connected to something we call the principle of effability, and it is effability, not affability. And in, 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 in my work, we call it a semantic universal. So a semantic universal is a defining feature of human language. All human languages do this. 
The lack of particular words to express certain concepts does not mean that there's no way for that language to express the concept. Some algyah is an example. And you'll find these tropes all over, right? It's like, you know, the, the, the you know, in, in Polynesia, I've heard the story when the, the colonists came, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't see their ships because they didn't have a word for it. All that stuff is mythology, right? And it has to be that way because we're all humans and language is a defining characteristic for a species. This is where things get interesting. There are two different versions of this. One is the strong effability. So every proposition, that's something that you think about is the sense of some sentence in each natural language. This is kind of interesting. Uh, and I'll show you why creatively. If you read any Umberto Eco and sort of on the philosophy of language side, what this means, it brings you to some really interesting areas because what it means is, you know, the question we have to ask about is ask ourselves, are there things that are unknowable simply because we can't talk about them? It's sort of a thought problem. And people like Umberto Eco will explore this. So what does it mean if we, you know, using your inner voice, if you can't actually describe it in your head, is that a thought? that's unknowable, does it still exist somewhere? Like in sort of Plato's third realm, like can we actually, is it some sort of geometric shape that we can't imagine, like infinity for the highest prime number? The one that we're working with though mostly is weak ability. So this is about translation, okay? As I just showed you, if language one has it, language two also has it. You just gotta find a way of doing it. There are no inaccessible meanings that way. So why are these useful? Okay, well, let's look at this creatively. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is Orwell's new speak, right? This is an application of linguistic determinism and he was doing it creatively and purposefully in creating a world, the fictional language of Oceania, I assume you read 1984, right? I mean, this is right. Right, so the idea there was to have language as a way of engineering thinking. And so this is an application of determinism and also effability. Strong ability. So what you do is you modify the language to make certain thoughts off limits. Okay, and now that's that's really just a philosophical exercise, whether it actually works or not. But the point is made. You know, yeah, jumping to a completely different world, Klingon is like that too. This is a form of linguistic determinism. If you read into Klingon, I mean, it's a very well-known story how it was invented. Guttural, glottalized sounds, all, the, all these sorts of sounds and adjectives and whatnot. Right, it's verb initial. Um, it has the sense of barbarity, at least to English speakers, it does. It probably doesn't in the pulp, which also has all those same sounds. Mm -hmm. And it's also verb initial and lacks adjectives. Like a lot of languages do that. I think that was unintentional, but it was a perception for English speakers to do that. And I didn't, I forgot to include a slide on the, the letter shapes. They're all like pointy, right? Good. They're all very, they're very spiky. Um, Klingons love for bladed weapons, okay, whatnot. Pokemon is kind of an interesting case too. This was uh, a language that developed actually fairly recently um, that was inspired by Tao's philosophy. And the idea there, and this, this is kind of a neat story, you should look into it. It was, a, it was a therapeutic language as a way of, the person that invented it was, it was dealing with depression and as a way of like calming and simplifying your thinking, she invented a language to do that, to sort of like calm your mind. And that is also kind of determinism. It's sort of a positive use of it though. The thing is that determinism always introduces biases. Um, I'll come back to that. If ability is applied in something, maybe you've seen this from a rival, right? So, um, well, I'll talk about Contact first, which is a great book, uh, Rick Sagan's book, right? This sort of communication that was done through prime numbers, that's some kind of communication, but it's not necessarily language, okay? Or these heptapod, the heptapod language in a rival. Um, so using images, and I read a little bit about this. My colleague actually, Jessica Kuhn, worked on that. I mean, she's in the guild, and she's a colleague of mine, and, and, and I've discussed this with her. And, and some of the problems, well, kind of neat issues they're bringing up to do with like, uh, so what it means to actually think something versus actually writing it out. Um, it's not clear, it's not fully developed, but it's kind of a neat idea. But it, this is about probably strong ability that there may be what was suggested in the language of the communication of arrival is that there are propositions that are unknowable, things that you can't think. Now that has to do with an alien language, so all bets are off, right? We don't know what the features of their language are, but that's kind of a neat thing to play with is strong ability. Are you able to talk about, well, think about that for a second. It's like even doing that, what are things that are unknowable? Are they unknowable because we can't talk about them? Right, so there's a kind of reasoning there that's sort of interesting. To come in full circle here, like uh, with constructed languages and artistic languages, I know that's what we're interested in here, um, but we do need to make a distinction because uh, artistic languages are a subtype of constructed languages. 
Contractor language generally are usually projects in social activism. And Esperanto is probably the wealth, most well known of that. It's a part of language planning and engineering. And if you look into the history of Esperanto, it's a very noble idea. It's also like 130 years ago. It's not a new one. And for only a thousand, I think there's like a thousand speakers of Esperanto. Mm -hmm. We can talk about the success of that. Anyway, the intention was humans were meant to use them, right? The project of Esperanto. Um, and also Tokipona as well. Artistic languages are designed with an aesthetic purpose, at least I think. I'm, and, and I'm stepping outside my area a little bit because I don't actually do constructed languages. I mean, I, of course, I, I study them as a part of what I do, but I use a different thing with constructed languages. I look at ethability. How can we use constructed languages to sort of probe the limits of propositional thinking, like what it means to be knowable, right, in your inner voice? Um, there's some really neat... Um, experiments that I can I can talk about if you like or point you in the direction of right it's about it's about work world building all back <laughs> right that's what we're doing so they may or may not be based on natural language that's your choice uh, I think it's a design choice that you make now spoken artistic languages generally aren't meant to be used by humans but people do it anyway because you can learn Klingon you can also learn Dothraki you can actually get a certificate of Dothraki if you want but that was not David Peterson's no relation. The guy who created uh, Dothraki. That was not the intent. It's it's a creative project, right? It has dramatic purpose to it. The thing is that whatever you're doing, if you're putting pen to paper and you're making a language, you are engaging in an ideological project. You're doing something, and you will introduce biases. Okay, no matter how innocent you might think it is. I got a couple of really neat cases of that. One is Jar Jar Binks, <laughs> right? So you know where I'm going with this. Yeah, he, George Lucas was criticized for that, and rightfully so, right? Because it, it, it's unclear. I guess he's a second language learner of English. That's probably hard for me to stop. I'm always having it. One more minute. Right? And it's a sort of patois that he's speaking, and it's, you know, and it's like, but he's playing with this alien identity. Should we be offended by that? Because it's not human. Well, it is a racial caricature, so yes. Was it determinism or not? And the other, has anybody seen The Expanse? This is a great example of a constructed Creole. Right, and this is where you're making an identity through the language, and this was very intentionally done. Oops, that's it. This is actually happening here. That's fine. I can keep talking anyway. I can see my slides over here. So why that? So, um, yeah. It's still okay. there, but it's yeah. It's One more minute, sure, and I'm done. Yeah, you're good. I'm upset with that. No, that's okay. Yeah, all the flat slides. So when we're thinking about constructed languages, I went through that. Um, Right. And there are other examples of this where a language was created for the purposes of constructing an identity around these underprivileged people out in outer space. Right. And it's really well done. That I have looked at closely. And linguists actually worked on that. It's really done. Now, Creoles are very interesting because they're usually an underclass or working class. And this is found around the world, especially around the equator. We see Creoles all over the place. And they're usually. Yeah, an underclass, and they're, they're, they're languages that are looked down upon, and that was done on purpose. So anyway, I kind of made this up. Um, so when I think about, from a, the perspective of a, a, a linguist and one that practices the philosophy of language, this is how I might look at the design features of constructed language. They're non-natural. You're making it up, okay? It's your choice to actually make it, to import natural features, but that is an act that's conscious, and you're going to introduce biases. It's an ideological and it's a creative project, right from the very first word, okay? You have to think about grammatical design, like the morphology I showed you, sound design, like the sound system cling on, the choices that were made that were linguistic determinism. You have to think about the biases you introduce, the visual design, the ideological design, and the identity design, okay? So you're doing these things whether you know it or not. Okay, you're doing this. Last couple of slides, I had to put this in here. Dot and dot. This one, the movement of language, which I've worked on in Brazil, is these mean different things. One is armadillo and one is art. <laughs> Now, this is a perception that you're not used to because we don't have different phonation types on our vowels. One is dot and one is dot. Dot, dot. You creak your voice. That's what that little tilde underneath means. 
They live in the South Central Amazon. Um, and the reason why I included that is to really, I guess it's a personal sort of position that I take on this, even a linguist who works with understudied and endangered languages. I guess I can kind of like adapt between, uh, you know, what is it, truth is stranger than fiction. It's like, yeah, reality is more interesting than fiction. <laughs> Any of these languages that I've shown you, I mean, the bar set pretty high creatively, if you know what I mean. And that's it. Oh. How many times have you been on the other side? I'm happy to talk to you later. Uh, or if you want any sources to be great. Thank you so much, Tyler. Uh, Bro, whenever you're ready. Let's do it. All right. I'll pass this on to you. Nice. All right, time to get out of the workhouse. Yes. Aha. Uh, All right. Um, a few things. First, I have to make a confession, which is that I have not taken a linguistics class. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. Um, but I want to make it very clear that where I am coming from is a very different space than Professor Peterson is coming from. Uh, my background is in fiction writing, speculative fiction writing. I write entirely fantasy, magical realism, eco-fabulism. I write different worlds. And when I look at language, I am always looking at it from the perspective of conscious identity formation within alternate worlds and alternate realities. And obviously there's going to be some overlap in terms of vocabulary, but I think that it's always important that we like take into account our intention going into a our like relationship with the language. So I'm going to talk about the untranslatable. This is a big buzzword. Um, it's something that gets talked about in fiction. I also am lucky enough to be in a translation course right now, and we're always talking about like what does untranslatable mean. Um, and we have a great quote: Salman Rushdie, "The history of a culture can be determined by its untranslatable words." And I promise I didn't actually know what Professor Peterson was going to talk about to get to this. Um, apparently, this is just an interesting topic for us. So I want to think about the concept of untranslatable a little differently. Obviously, as Professor Peterson pointed out, any concept that you have in one language, you can like express it in another language. It might not be the exact same number of words. That's often what people mean when they say like untranslatable. They're translating a poem and they're like, oh God, this one word, it has so many different associations and connotations. How can I possibly find one word that does all the same job? And the answer is you won't because languages are living and they're complex. And so there isn't going to be a one-to-one -one correlation, but something that you're expressing in one language can always be expressed in another. However, when we're looking at fiction, there is a different level of untranslatability which is the lived experience of existing in the world that you are trying to create. And fundamentally, whenever we're looking at a piece of fiction that is not realistic fiction, it is a different world. It might be only gently different. It might be New York, but with this one thing that changed in its past, or it could be entirely different. It can be you know, alien races on planets that are billions of light years away. But no matter what, there is a fundamental difference that changes how the people in that universe experience their world. And so when we think about untranslatability, I, when I look at con constructed languages, what I like to think about is that constructed la languages are a way for us to translate the untranslatable experience of living in a different world. And part of that is through language. We communicate using language. And if you have constructed a world in which they communicate using language, language is going to be the most tactile and intimate way to get to know that world. So you guys probably don't actually need this introduction anymore. I wasn't really sure whether uh, <laughs> Professor Peterson was going to talk about constructed languages. Um, but I think, again, I want to just, you know, focus on the fact that constructed languages have not evolved naturally. They are created on purpose by a person or a team of people and therefore are never going to contain the breadth of experience and time and evolution that a natural language is going to include. So now that we've sort of looked at constructed languages and the differences in natural languages, I think that Professor Peterson covered this really well. I do just wanna highlight um, the places that uh, constructed languages start to vary. 
Um, we have like art languages, we have experimental languages that are these attempts at a social experiment or a change in the world. We have um, constructed languages that are constructed for fictional worlds and specific projects such as like Dothraki or Quenya. Those are the ones that I'm going to be talking about the most, which is constructed languages for the specific purpose of a piece of fiction or a piece of TV, film, single use media. So constructed languages are hellaciously complicated. Like, let's just be honest. Uh, language is a massively complicated beast. It is, the more you look at it, the more complicated it gets. You think like after, you know, middle school, you understand how a sentence works and then you actually learn how a sentence works and you realize you don't know any, I, you have no idea how you were actually managing to make it through the world and like converse on a daily basis. So when you're looking at incorporating a constructed language into a piece of fiction, a novel, a TV show, um, a film, a video game, a live action role play, I don't know, anything in which you are creating a different world and you want to integrate a constructed language into it. There is the obvious downside of the fact that it's a massive amount of work. But I think that there are a lot of incredible upsides. The first being what I was trying to get at in the opening, which is that a different world is going to bring with it a different flavor of experience. And that's going to be something that you can never just sit down and write in prose, start to beginning. This is how it feels to be a baby in this world, to be a child in this world, to grow up in this world, to have your first kiss in this world to see snow in this world. Like you're never going to be able to just create a single prose description that manages to effectively convey what that experience is like. But in creating a constructed language, you are able to, in some ways, enter the mind of somebody who inhabits that world. You get a sense of the way that they think about action, the way that they think about relation, the way that they think about different words and their associations and you end up getting to get a slightly more intimate understanding of a group of people. And one big thing that you can do is differentiate between cultures. If you're working in a high, high fantasy landscape or anything where you have a bunch of different cultures on the page and you want to create more marked differences between them instead of just being like, these are the people who live in the mountains and these are the people who live by the sea. One of the great ways that you can create a strong rooted culture is by creating constructed languages for them. This brings a sense of like standardization to the names, to the name places, to the way that they come up with words for different objects, the ways that they express time, things like that. If you create a different language for each one of them, and if you create shared languages, if you create a language that has an association with class, there's always the in fantasy worlds, people love to do their like the high language and the low language, which I think that's that's a whole own mess. But by creating languages that are associated with different places, different times, um, you can differentiate differentiate between cultures that exist at the same time, and you can even differentiate a culture over the course of time. If you have a world like Tolkien's world, which has multiple ages, you can differentiate between the first, second, and third age of the elves. Um, differentiation between species um, and biological differentiation. This is not something that I know a lot about. However, we know that language is created by what we have physically. We've got lungs, we have an esophagus, we have our articulators. And if you are a different creature, if you are an alien creature that has four esophagi and 75 tentacles, <laughs> the language that you can create is going to be fundamentally different than the one that I can. Um, I think that it requires a lot more imagination and perhaps a stronger grasp on anatomy and physiology than I currently possess. But creating a constructed language that reflects those biological differences is going to be a more robust way of putting that on the page than just being like, this is my alien friend, Bob, who has 79 tentacles. Um, something that we talk about a lot in fiction is the idea of the iceberg. And this, I think that it gets referenced almost everywhere that you know, the iceberg is so much bigger underneath the water than it is above the water. And it goes with fiction with a sense of when you are creating a world or when you are creating a scene that has emotional depth, the things that you put directly on the page, the things that you say directly are always only going to be 5% of what actually exists. And I think that the problem that we get when we are creating cultures is that a lot of people Sometimes we'll just go ahead and be like, okay, so what's a culture? It's like a religion, a location, a traditional form of garb. And then they, they stick it there. And that's all you get. 
and you have to try to like remember which one is the which one because there's the horse riding people and then there's the dragon riding people and that's like all you get. Um, but by constructing a language, you are entering into the psyches of these different groups of people and you are creating a differentiation and a sense of knowledge within yourself. This isn't necessarily something the readers are going to know because they're not necessarily going to pick up your 17 dictionaries of all the different constructed languages that you've made. But it's important that you as a writer and a creator have that intimate knowledge of the people that you are writing about. Um, constructed languages are also great for the creation of secondary texts. If it's important to have that kind of metatextuality within the pieces that you're writing, if you wanna have a holy text, if you wanna have poems, if you wanna have like, you know, the gravestone that people haven't been able to translate yet, you want to be able to have the people who are like trying to translate these shipping logs to solve a crime or whatever, then you can include secondary texts within your text that make the world feel more real and more vast and more richly imagined to your reader. There's always the option to use it for plot. I think that this can be, it can, it can frankly be sloppily done often um, if you're just using it to create conflict between like, there's the people who speak this language and the people who speak that language. Um, that's enough of a problem just in general, but I think that it can be done more deftly if you are focusing on people who potentially navigate spaces that hold different languages and they themselves are people who speak multiple languages. If you are looking at the way that it feels to be somebody who understands something in this way, in that way, in that way, in that way, and they know how to express it in this way, in that way, in that way, then if especially if you are doing like first person narrators, then you can add a depth of interiority to those characters. And obviously it contributes to the scope and range of a project. Um, it's an easy way, well, no, it's not an easy way. <laughs> it's an effective way <laughs> to make a world that feels as though it does exist, a world that feels like you could step into it. So going about creating a constructed language is complicated. Um, it begins first with sound. I think that a lot of times um, when we first think about a language, the initial interaction we have with it is on the level of sound. Uh, if you are an English speaker, there are going to be things that sound familiar to you and don't sound familiar to you. And I think it's really important to talk about, particularly if you are coming from the tradition of fantasy or magical realism or generally like speculative fiction, and you're looking to incorporate sounds that either sound familiar or sounds that don't sound familiar, where that sense of familiarity is coming from. Um, if you are looking to specifically make a language that sounds like a language that exists in our world, a good place to start is always just looking at a phonological inventory, looking at the sounds that exist in that language. Um, I've seen this done often in films where they'll be speaking a constructed language and as a speaker of X, Y, and Z language, I'm like, wait a minute, do I know that one? And then I'm like, no, that one does not exist in real life. That's because they have just picked, you know, almost all the same sounds as exist in this bucket and then they have rearranged them. However, I think that something that's really important to talk about is that a lot of times when you're creating a fantasy world, there is an instinct or there is a tradition that exists where people want to create a language that sounds exotic. And this is just, it's complicated on many levels. Um, I think that for one, fantasy is a tradition that originated in a lot of imperialism and colonialism. There's a lot of travel narratives. There's a lot of narratives of even in sci-fi, like space exploration, a lot of it being space colonization. And if you are already participating in a narrative that is about colonization, it is and there is an additional level that happens when you then create a constructed language in which you are utilizing sounds that sound exotic to you and are not exotic to speakers of many natural languages in this world. Um, and there are some sounds that are rarer in different languages. There are some sounds that are nearly universal that we have in most languages. You know, the ah sound exists in many, 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 many languages, non polonic consonants are a little bit less common. Um, but I think that if you are to just try to, you know, cherry pick the sounds that don't sound familiar to your ear and use them to make an exotic sounding language, um, it's, youth, it's, it's worth doing an active interrogation of why you want to create an exotic language. Um, the last thing to consider just with sound is there is some research, 
I don't, I don't know, uh, <laughs> Professor Peterson, um, about the history of this research or how well proven it was. From what I could tell, it sounds like there is like a good amount of literature around it um, that's found a correlation between different environments and different features of language. From what I could tell, it sounds like um, there is a correlation between warmer environments and uh, languages that have a higher sonority, so basically louder languages in warmer climates. And um, that is because in warmer climates, you would theoretically be outside a lot and so potentially would be communicating with people further away from you. Um, and then in colder climates, there is a tendency towards uh, languages with a lower sonority, potentially because you're inside, potentially because opening your mouth and exposing yourself to the cold elements is uh, challenging. Um, there is also a tendency in humid, wet environments towards having more languages that are tonal, um, because potentially humid, uh, humid climates allow for a certain amount of like dexterity in the vocal cords, and tonal languages are they require a lot of dexterity in order to be able to accurately create. Um, and then also just uh, within the context of your language, if you are creating a language that's spoken in, for instance, a city where it's maybe going to be like a very loud, a uh, very loud space where people are going to be yelling to each other all the time, um, it makes sense to include a lot more um, uh, phones that have like a higher sonority value. Just you know, languages that you can yell at each other. Um, but again, that's not my area of expertise. That is just what I have found in my own research. Um, so one thing that you can do in language is gender. I think that this is something that we we talk, there's a lot of confusion about what gender in language means. Um, gender in language is not the same as gender in the social construct. Um, and it does not have anything to do with biological sex. Gender within uh, language and particularly within the context of creating a constructed language, which does not have a history attached to it, um, or at least not a real one. Gender is a way of creating different species of words, words that, you know, you can have X, Y, and Z bucket that have X, Y, and Z inherent values. And then most importantly, they have a relationship with the other words that are around them. If you have a language such as French, um, there are masculine and feminine nouns and masculine and feminine nouns mean that you have to have masculine and feminine adjectives. They have to agree, your verbs agree, your articles agree, everything agrees. <laughs> um, and so it introduces redundancy, which means that in a sentence, if you, for instance, lose part of the noun, you're talking in a cafe and you can't hear, um, there are other elements of the sentence that are always going to be reminding you of the gender of the noun. This is something that I'm having to deal with in my translations currently um, in French, which is that there can be an additional level of complexity in sentences because you can kind of do this like juggling act with nouns because the nouns have different attributes and you can attach attributes with the verbs and the adjectives to those nouns. And so it's a lot easier to remember which noun is which and have sentences that are hellaciously long. Um, when you're making a constructed, gen uh, constructed language, um, there are reasons you might want to create a gender system for that language. Um, the first would be the situation of that language. Is it one that you need to be able to include a lot of complexity in? Is it one where you want to be able to write incredibly long sentences that have multiple subject subjects and do like a lot of intense juggling with them? And would it be useful for you to have ways to differentiate the characteristics of those? Um, the Situation of where you're speaking it in person is also one that's good, worth keeping in mind. If this is a language that is dead and was only spoken by four people and we don't know where it came from and we don't really know the situation of it, that's going to be different than if this is a language that's spoken in a densely populated urban area um, that is also like a trade port city and there's a lot going on and you want to be able to include that sort of like that backup. Um, and then the third would be marking values in a culture. This does definitely get into the question of linguistic relativism. In this sense, you are creating a language with a particular ideological value attached to it. You are, whether you are doing it on purpose or not, you have a fictional world that you have created and you're creating a language that you want to reflect that fictional world. So it, if you want to add additional elements of um, texture to the language and you want those to reflect the culture, 
then you might pick a specific gendering system. So masculine and feminine is not the only gendering system that exists. And there are gendering systems to mark animate versus inanimate objects. There are gendering systems which include like human, animal, plant. Um, you could, if you were doing a fiction piece about um, that was a sci-fi world in which humans or another humanoid race were battling an android race, then you could decide to create a gendering system in which there was a gender marker for natural things and unnatural things. So for instance, a rock, a tree, and a human might be in the natural things category, and a computer, a cell phone, and the android that wants to kill you would be in the unnatural category. And if you do that, that means that in every single sentence that you write in that language, whenever you are making, say, verbs and adjectives agree, you are always forcing that differentiation and you are deepening that divide within the language itself. So verbs, um, I, I think we all know what verbs are here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that assumption. Um, <laughs> languages mark verbs differently. Um, languages var sometimes mark verbs for person, number, gender, definiteness, case, tense, aspect, mood. Um, so when you're constructing a language, you can decide how and whether you want to mark verbs for any and all of these things. Um, one interesting thing to play around with is if you want to sort of force a shift in perspective onto a people in a fictional uh, book or fictional world, then you can change how they think about time. Um, so if you wanted to, you could make it so that there is no verbal way to mark past or future. You could only mark present things and indefinite things. And then other things you would need to just like do a little bit of like, you know, linguistic gymnastics to have some kind of complicated phrase to be like, to mark that past or future. But the only habitual way to talk about things is in the present tense or in indefinite terms. Um, if you had a culture that perhaps suffered a massive collective trauma and then that causes societal taboo against speaking of the past, you could get rid of the past tense or have it exist and have it be taboo to utilize it. So one way to quickly create a unique, if not necessarily natural, definitely not natural, um, constructed language is to drop certain common aspects of language. There are as many different natural languages in the world as there are people in this world, and no two people speak language the same way. And there are many different features that are shared over most groups. Um, so things like adjectives are relatively common. Um, if you wanted to place an emphasis on action, then you could choose to remove all adjectives in a language and then compensate by you creating adjectival phrases using verbs. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to say instead of like, she is beautiful, it would be she is beautifuling. She is being beautiful in this moment. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, even that, which is like an incredibly basic example, that has a different flavor to it. Instead of it being an inherent quality that you know this person carries all the time, um, it is something that is temporal. She is being beautiful in this moment, and we don't know whether she's going to be beautiful tomorrow or whether she was beautiful yesterday. Um, that is obviously like these these kinds of removing functions are you know going at it with an axe instead of a knife um, or scalpel. It's definitely not the most graceful way. But if you are wanting to get deeper into the psyche of your characters or of a group of people or of a group of people who have constructed a language and want to impose it on other people, then doing these broad strokes can be useful for understanding exactly why you want to make those choices. Um, and then the last example is possession. Um, if you have a fictional world in which there is a religious tradition um, that has their own language, either constructed or natural. Um, perhaps in their belief system, it's not possible to own something only to cross paths with it for a time. Mm -hmm. If you have that world, then you don't really want to have possession or uh, possessives. Um, that would be either it wouldn't have evolved naturally or it would just be taboo and it wouldn't be okay to talk about things that way. It would be considered disrespectful. So the plot solution to this, if you were not using a conlang, if you were just trying to like make this clear in your prose, would be to have some kind of like over expositional scene in which somebody describes this belief system or one or two instances of dialogue correction where somebody's like, pass me your book and it's not my book, it's this book. 
something like that. Those can feel kind of ham-handed. Um, so instead, what you could do is just get rid of possessives in a con line. Um, this would require some forms of compensation, um, utilizing proper nouns, using you know demonstratives, this book, that book, um, and case-specific constructions like the book in the room where I sleep instead of my book in my room. Mm -hmm. um, and you know this isn't necessarily good or bad, but it is a way to hammer home a specific way of thinking and to make it more present on the page. So if you want to do, if you want to do this, if you want to create a constructed language, I think the first two steps before you start putting pen to paper or start Googling what the IPA is, the first things that you need to do are to think about the people or groups who will be using your language. So within your fictional world, um, what values do they hold? What is the most important inherent thing within their world belief? Um, how do they interact with the people around them? How do they find meaning in things? Um, and how do they most often use their language? Is their language one that is used for written <laughs> communication? Is it one that's used for creation? Is it one that's used for oral communication? What purpose is their language serving? And then the second is to think about the people who will be experiencing your language. So your readers, your viewers, whoever they may be, what are you saying to them? What are you presenting as strange or different? Um, and I think most importantly, um, what new ways of thinking are you introducing? Because language already exists. Great languages already exist. Many of them exist. And as Professor Peterson said, many languages exist that are incredibly endangered. And why do we really need to be making new languages? Um, I think, especially at risk of creating languages that could be exoticizing or fetishizing or in other ways being disrespectful to languages that do exist. I think that the only saving grace of constructed languages is that they can potentially introduce new ways of thinking to real people who do exist. Um, <laughs> I work primarily in the realm of ecofabulism, so I am always trying to find ways that the imagination can serve, serve like a better, more hopeful future. Um, in the world of ecofiction, there's a lot of doom and gloom, and you know the world's going to end in 20 years, and there's no hope. Um, and I think that. Constructed languages are one way that we can generate new, more hopeful, and more expansive ways of thinking, not just on the page or in a single book, but ways of thinking that are able to stay with us and that we're able to integrate into our worldview. Yeah. If you have any questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ro. Thank you, Tyler. These were fantastic. Um, thank you all. Uh, we're going to end with a, a world building exercise. Uh, be able to do it in the room. Those of you who are online. Um, we're talking a little bit about uh, this. Will be about like fifteen minutes, and uh, to talk about world building through box words, which is a uh, word or a phrase coined by Ursula Le Guin in her review of China Mabel's Embassy Town, in which she said one of the virtuosities of science fiction is the invention of box words that the reader must open to discover a trove of meaning and implication. I love the idea of the word being a box that can be opened. The imaginative leaps involved in decoding such inventions and appreciating their wit can give a reader much pleasure. So we're going to invent our own box words today while we're here together. Um, we're going to uh, give you a couple of examples, and then we'll get into the sort of exercise. Uh, my students from my world building class are going to perform. We'll recognize some of these or some of these that are coming up. Uh, maybe I'll just do a couple of these. Uh, the first one is sesapine, which are these paired organs at the back of the neck in N.K. Jemison's The Fifth Season. It's a made-up word. I think everybody who reads that book eventually Googles it and tries to find out if it's a real organ. Um, but it's completely invented, and it allows people in this sort of climate-damaged world to detect earthquakes, weather events, predator attacks, um, and other things. When you use them, it's called sessing. So we have this invented word and then another invented word derived from it. I like that a lot. Um, in Ursula Le Guin's heinous psycho novels like Left Hand for Darkness, there's an instantaneous communica communication device called Ansible, which Le Guin said she wrote because it sounded to her like answerable, that it was this sort of like um, mishearing of that word. Uh, in China Mio's Embassy Town, which Le Guin was writing about, there's a word called Mia, which I never knew what meant. I just ha have to figure this out recently. Uh, it's an acronym for message in a bottle, that the messages that go out into space on the ships are because they're called Mayas as message in a bottle. Uh, and then this last one from Yuri Herrera's Science Machine in the Underworld, which was written in Spanish, the Mexican novelist. 
Uh, he invented this word, uh, which I'm going to, my Spanish pronunciation is terrible, but jar, 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 uh, which is a neologism from uh, Herrera from Spanish that he means like to exit. He uses it every time someone crosses the border in the book um, or leaves a place or goes to a new location. But he took it from the Arabic karja, which means an exit. So it's been translated and verbified into sort of a new word. When Lisa Dillman translated it, she also had wanted to translate it into another new word, to not just use the word the same way or use it a different way. And she ends up using like to verse as it. So the main character is versing across the border. She verses when she moves into other places. So these sort of different ways of making things. Um, okay. okay, so where do new words come from? We brought Tyler here to be a foil. I am also not a linguist. Um, <laughs> some places that you can get some new words from. We have compound words like spaceship from space and ship. We put words together. We have abbreviations that become standard words. Uh, we, we scuba, uh, but we hardly ever think self-contained underwater breathing apparatus when we're doing it, right? Uh, we clip or shorten words, phone instead of telephone, then cell instead of cell phone. Uh, we have onomatopoeias, just words that sound like things. The really interesting ones to me are when the sound didn't used to exist in the word world. Zap first appears in 1920, presumably with like widespread electricity. Uh, no one could be zapped until that. You were not zapped by lightning bolts before you had electricity in your house. I think that's weird. Um, we have loan words, of course, from other languages. Emoji that we all say all the time comes from E plus moji, picture letter, picture character. Uh, blends or combined words. Chortle uh, comes from chuck or snort, chuckle and snort. I was like, does anyone use chortle in like real life? And it was in a book I was listening to an audiobook today. I was like, all right, one. Uh, <laughs> names that become descriptive language, Kafkaesque, Orwellian, um, you know, all these different sort of names that we use in this way. And then we have verbifying. I was taught to call it inverbing, which I like too. Otherwise, pressing one part of speech into another one. Google, the proper noun, becomes Google, the verb. We have these different verbs that are words that work this way. Um, I tried to make one of these happen in a New York Times review I wrote this summer. I was like, I'm going to get this new word in the New York Times. And the editor was like, that's not a word. I'm like, but it's kind of like one. It's pretty good. He's like, if we let you put it in the New York Times, it'll like officially be a word in the record. I'm like, right. Let me have my word. Um, <laughs> was not impressed. They're good guardians of the language. Um, okay, so our exercise. We're going to do this a couple parts. Uh, we're going to do four things. One, everyone's going to invent and define a new word of their own. I'll put that last slide up after I go through this so you can look at that again. Uh, we're taking about five minutes, so we're very quickly going to invent words. And then we're going to pair up. Uh, those of you are in person, we'll just do with people beside us. Online, once we get to that point, my friend Jan is going to put you in breakout rooms so you can say hi to people. Um, and when we get into those breakout rooms or in your groups, you're going to teach your word to someone else, and then they're going to use it in a sentence back to you so that you can hear your invented word. So this should be an exchange. You'll invent a word, you'll define it, you'll teach it, and then they will say it back to you. And we'll talk about step four in just a second. So first, for the next five minutes, take your time, take a piece of paper, write one wherever you can, use your cell phone, and oops, sorry, that's what you do. Use uh, any of these ideas, anything else you'd like, and invent a word of your own. All right, I'll give you five minutes, then we'll move into the final phase here. Good luck. Yeah, it's something like 
I mean, I think we're probably Okay, if you have if you have your word, if you're ready to share it, uh, you're already talking to each other in the room. So as you're in the room, keep talking to each other. Teach your word, ask them using a sentence. Um, those of you who are online, Jan's going to put you in breakout room so you can meet each other and chat for a little bit. And we'll do that for like seven, eight minutes and we'll come back and we'll uh, we'll do a quick goodbye thing and we'll call tonight. Thank you all so much. Jen, go ahead. Got it.
All right. So it's awful to use my teacher voice to stop people from having fun talking to each other. So I apologize for that. Um, thank you all so much. We're going to just end with just giving you ways to that fourth step to share and record your box word if you'd like. Uh, you can tweet it and its definition to us at ASU oh. underscore world build. That uh, Twitter account is about 24 hours old, so you can be one of our seven followers. See what you want. Um, just get it going. Uh, you can also send it to me at matthew.d.bell at ASU or to just send comments about today or feedback. We'd love to hear from you. I uh, hope you'll stay in touch. Um, you can also, we set up this Google form. It uses QR code. Uh, you can go right to it, save it for later. I think uh, we're also going to email it to you tomorrow. Um, just to let us record like uh, your word, its definition, its, uh, its sentence, if you remember that, or new sentence. Um, if we get enough of them, I'm going to put them together in a little PDF primer and send it out to everybody. And we'll have like a primer of the language we invented together today. And then, of course, you can use it in a story or artwork of your own. Um, one of the reasons I want everybody to share them and to turn them into sentences is I really don't believe language sort of exists unless another person is like hearing it and speaking it, right? So, and, you know, you started out, we were temporarily the only living speaker of your word in the uh, in the world, and now there's at least two people. That seems exciting. You've doubled your language's effectiveness. Um, so thank you for that. Um, thanks so much to Tyler and Rowe for tonight. We can give them another round of applause. They're really fantastic. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Jan was just saying, I can't believe you tricked this many people into doing voluntary homework, which I am also excited about. So thank you for being a part of it. Um, thanks for getting us all this. Have a great night. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all again at our next event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to explain. I know.